In 1895, German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen was conducting experiments with a Crookes tube, a glass tube filled with gas that gave off light when a high voltage current was passed through it. Despite the tube being completely shielded by heavy black cardboard, Röntgen noticed that a screen made of fluorescent material turned green, even though it was nine feet away. The cardboard stopped all of the visible light, so Röntgen concluded that some hitherto unknown ray must have done it. He began to experiment with these new rays, finding that they could pass through certain objects and not others. Not knowing what kind of ray he was dealing with exactly, he decided to call it an X-ray, X as in a variable. To test his discovery, Röntgen made an X-ray image of his wife Bertha's hand, clearly showing the bones of her hand and her wedding ring. So alarmed was his wife at the image of her bones that she was reported to have gasped, I have seen my own death. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. The United States Patent and Trademark Office grants to the patentee the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling the invention. If you want to sell a product or license it to someone else, having a patent on something you have created is a big help. But a patent can't stop other people from ripping you off. It just gives you a legal weapon to seek redress. That is, if you wouldn't spend more time and money doing that than you lose if you just left it as is often the case when knockoff products are created overseas. Anyone can patent their novel and non-obvious design, but some notable names have chosen to release their ideas into the world for one reason or another. In bonus fact, the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 excludes the patenting of inventions useful solely in nuclear weapons. It's been a million years since man learned to control fire, but only about 200 years since we've had handy little toothpicks topped with incendiary material to get the fire started. We had to wait for a particular British man, one John Walker, to be born in Stockton-on-Tees in 1781, apprentice under the chief surgeon of the town, discover he couldn't stand the sight of blood, and decide to study chemistry and become a pharmacist instead. He was working on an experimental paste that might someday be used in guns, when the wooden instrument he was using to mix the substances in his paste burst into flames. This accidental breakthrough led him to create simple matches made from cardboard dipped in sulfur that was tipped with a mix of antimony sulfide, potassium chlorate, and gum arabic. These sold like hotcakes in his hometown. After he swapped the cardboard for three-inch-long wooden splints, he was receiving offers of purchase from neighboring towns and selling more and more. Copies sprang up all over, like a version marketed by Samuel Jones of London who called his matches Lucifer's. John Walker never patented his invention. Was he magnanimously giving mankind his new creation? Not as such. Walker realized that his invention was inherently dangerous even more dangerous than a lit match. The sulfur coating could sometimes drip off the stick while still burning, landing on the floor, flammable objects, even the user's clothes or skin. Everyone needed fire for candles, oil lamps, cooking stoves, industry, everything, and they wanted matches. Matchmaking became a common trade across England, with hundreds of factories spread across the country. There, workers dipped treated wood into the phosphorus concoction, then let it dry and cut the sticks in shifts of 12 to 16 hours. Like many poorly paid, tedious factory jobs in the 19th and early 20th century, matchmakers were predominantly women and children. Their dangerous working conditions had a unique hazard. Fossy jaw. This condition causes the bone in the jaw to decay and die resulting in extreme suffering and sometimes loss of the jaw. This gruesome and debilitating condition came from inhaling white phosphorus fumes all day and afflicted one in ten workers as much as five years after exposure. So maybe foregoing the patent and not putting his name on it forever was a smart move for Walker after all. Jump forward a hundred years or so, and young people were facing a different health crisis. Polio. While polio wasn't a raging epidemic, as it seems to be remembered, 
For perspective, children were ten times more likely to die as the result of an accident. It struck fear into the public because it appeared without warning, and researchers were unsure of how it spread from person to person. In 1938, a year into his second term as president, Franklin Roosevelt helped to create the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, later renamed the March of Dimes Foundation, which funded clinical trials in a desperate search for a cure or preventative. While most scientists believed that effective vaccines could only be developed with live viruses, Jonas Salk developed a killed virus vaccine by growing samples of the virus and deactivating them with formaldehyde so they could no longer reproduce. When injected into the bloodstream, the vaccine triggered the immune system to make protective antibodies, without the need to introduce a weakened form of the virus into a healthy patient. After successfully inoculating thousands of monkeys, in 1952, Salk began the risky step of testing the vaccine on humans, namely the human he married and the three smaller humans they'd made. With a positive outcome from testing on his family, double-blind studies, in which neither the researcher nor the subject knows if that person got the new drug or the placebo, were ordered. This was actually the first time double-blind testing was used, though it's now the standard for proper research. People eagerly volunteered to receive Salk's vaccine. On April 12, 1955, the day that the Salk vaccine was declared safe, effective, and potent, legendary CBS newsman Edward R. Murrow interviewed Salk and asked who owned the patent. Well, the people, I would say, said Salk, what with the millions of charitable donations raised by the March of Dimes that funded his research. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? One assumes that corporate lawyers everywhere began scrambling to see if you could patent the sun. Imagine the license fees. According to Forbes, a patent on Salk's vaccine would have earned him seven billion dollars, with a B. Now, not everyone believed Salk's killed virus vaccine was the right way to go. One such was Polish-born virologist Albert Sabine, who had developed an oral live virus polio vaccine. The Sabine vaccine was easier to give than Salk's injection, an important feature when you're trying to inoculate entire schools, towns, and even countries. And the effects of that one last longer. The Sabine vaccine works in the intestines, where the virus multiplies, to block the polio virus from entering the bloodstream. That allowed the vaccine to break the chain of transmission of the virus and create the possibility that polio could be completely eradicated. Once Sabine's oral vaccine became available in 1962, it quickly supplanted Salk's injected vaccine. Between the two vaccines, the number of polio cases worldwide dropped precipitously and just kept dropping. In 1988, there were 350,000 cases worldwide. By 2013, there were about 400. And one more thing about Sabine, who also developed vaccines against encephalitis and dengue fever and investigated possible links between viruses and certain cancers, he also refused to patent his vaccine. Now that you know you won't contract polio, you can continue on with your childhood, the age of Velcro sneakers, Gold Star stickers, and Chicken McNuggets. Future food scientist Robert Baker was a boy when the Great Depression cut the legs out from under Americans, especially in the Plain States, where years of irresponsible agriculture practices led to the Dust Bowl. The Baker family, which raised fruit in the summer and chickens in the winter, had to get good at making a small amount of food feed as many people as possible. This way of thinking stayed with Robert through his years at Cornell University, where he majored in pomology, the study and cultivation of fruit. He graduated in 43 and went to work for the Cornell Cooperative Extension as a liaison between the university research centers and local farmers. World War II increased the demand for chicken, and the poultry farmers had developed ways to grow their output, including advances in genetics and feed. But when the war was over, the demand dropped. Farmers didn't want to give up income by decreasing production, so they had to find ways to increase the market for chicken. From simple old-timey market stalls to mid-century grocers, chickens were almost always sold whole, which people were finding increasingly inconvenient. 
as opposed to beef or pork, which came in cuts. Meanwhile, Baker had begun to develop more of an interest in that aspect of his family's business, the chicken raising. He was hired by Cornell as an assistant professor in poultry science, tasked with finding ways to encourage people to eat more chicken. He and his team worked in a lab filled with grinders, blenders, and deboning machines, trying to develop, test, and taste new chicken products. They created chicken bologna, chicken sausage, chicken hot dogs, and chicken patties. Shrimp soup, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich. That's, that's about it. They also developed the broiler chicken, a two to three pound chicken more attractive to consumers and quicker to produce for farmers, and found ways to encourage people to eat more eggs. His most important achievement was a method that processed chicken, which allowed the meat to be shaped in any way possible. This gave birth to Baker's greatest invention, the chicken stick. Baker and a student figured out a way to keep the ground chicken meat together and get a delicious batter to adhere to it. First, they put raw chicken in a grinder with salt and vinegar to take out the moisture. Then they added powdered milk and mashed up grains, which helped to hold it together. They molded the processed chicken into sticks, froze them, dipped them in batter and cornflake crumbs, and froze them again. They developed a package and tested it at a local supermarket. Within six weeks, they were selling 200 boxes a day. If I'm saying Baker invented the chicken nugget, why isn't his name as well known as Ray Kroc or even the McDonald's brothers? Baker didn't patent his chicken sticks, or anything that he and his team had created. Said Robert Gravani, a Cornell professor who studied under Baker, he literally gave ideas away, and other people patented them. Plus, Cornell had published the whole process and all of his recipes in the April 1963 issue of Agricultural Economics Research a publication that was distributed for free to over 500 companies, including McDonald's. In 1977, the McGovern Report was released, urging Americans for the first time to eat less red meat. Burgers took a real PR hit and sales dropped. People wanted chicken, and McDonald's wanted their money. So they began to make their own frozen breaded chicken product using Baker's process, though their shapes are called the Bell boot, ball, and bow. In March of 1980, 15 Knoxville, Tennessee McDonald's debuted a new product, the Chicken McNugget. It set sales records, and soon, chicken nuggets were at every McDonald's worldwide. Over 2 billion servings, and that can be anywhere from 4 to 20 nuggets at a time, are sold each year, which is not doing us any favors with the whole obesity thing. And that's ironic when you remember that it came from a desire to make scarce food go farther. Though Baker never saw revenue share from those billions of sales, he did get inducted into the American Poultry Hall of Fame in 2004, so he's got that going for him, which is nice. Speaking of nice, we got another nice review over on the Apple Podcasts app. This one from E.C. Asaro, who says... This podcast is very well researched. You're definitely going to learn something new every time you listen. Moxie also has a very soothing voice to listen to on the way to work or after a long day. Keep up the great work. I especially loved the Jews writing Christmas songs episode. Thanks, EC. And that is one of the episodes that I am most proud of. I'm really glad that you enjoyed it. Thanks to all the folks who boost our social media, like the Florida Men podcast, Christopher Scott, Laura, Eric Parfait, Odd Dad Out, Richard Enriquez, and more. And of course, I am always grateful to our supporters over on patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts. Their first bonus mini episode for this month, of which some members will get two, was all about people learning to cook and eat poisonous indigenous plants. And that was something that had always been of interest to me. Like, how did people, what made people so sure that that thing was going to eventually be edible? Like, how many villagers do you have to poison before you say, you know, that root just might not be the one for us. We also had a great post in the Brainiacs break room from Paul Somo. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Who said, today I learned that Dr. Pepper is not owned by Pepsi or Coke. 
It's owned by Keurig. There aren't enough Keurig bottlers and distributors in the United States, so the majority of Dr. Pepper is bottled under contract by both Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So if someone asks if Dr. Pepper is a Coke or a Pepsi product, the answer is no. I added the bonus fact that the man who invented the Keurig coffee machine doesn't own one. He's been quoted as saying that drip coffee really isn't that hard to make, not to mention all the pollution. So thanks, Paul, for shining a light on that. Speaking of lights, let's talk about light bulbs. Not the incandescent bulb created by Thomas Edison and his team. Edison was big on getting patents for everything, even things he didn't invent. No, we're talking about the successor of the incandescent bulb, the LED. The light-emitting diode is an electric component that emits light when connected to direct current, which is called electroluminescence. LEDs can emit light in any color of the visible spectrum, as well as infrared and ultraviolet. They leave incandescent bulbs in the dust when it comes to size, lifespan, and energy efficiency. Really, the only thing the incandescent has going forward are easy-bake ovens. But LEDs almost didn't get invented. In 1907, a British experimenter at Marconi Labs noticed that when 10 volts were applied to silicon carbide crystal, it emitted a yellowish light. Not much light, though. Enough to see, but not enough to see by. He put the novelty aside and forgot about it. Twenty years later, the same thing happened to two other researchers, but with zinc sulfide and copper, and happened again later in a Russian research lab. Again and again, the electroluminescence was interesting, but not useful. So back on the shelf it went. Another thirty-odd years passed, when engineers with Texas Instruments found that gallium arsenide diode emitted infrared light when it was connected to current. That was useful but you still couldn't see it. Thankfully, the following year, over at General Electric, Nick Holoniak Jr. developed the first light-emitting diode that emitted a light in the visible range, specifically red. Holoniak wasn't trying to create a light that would replace incandescent bulbs. He was actually trying to make a laser, or as he described it, a device that didn't exist until we made it. At first, LEDs were expensive, about $200 a piece. Because of that, they were used as indicators on highly professional laboratory equipment. Fairfield Semiconductors succeeded in the 1970s in reducing the cost of individual LEDs from $200 to $0.05 cents by using a specific process in the production of semiconductor chips or LEDs. By using innovative methods of packaging and this what's called planar process of chip production, Fairchild led LEDs into commercial viability. These little diodes were poised to infiltrate our lives, from replacing incandescent neon lights to elements in seven-segment displays, large RGB screen displays, calculators, watches, flashlights, toys, and more. Infrared LEDs are used in remote controls like TVs and wireless game controllers. Holoniak had an instinct, all the way back at the beginning of LEDs, that these little efficient lights would replace bulbs eventually. But he didn't think it would take 50 years. Just as well he didn't patent it, that would have been a hell of a wait to get a return on investment. If you know why he didn't, please call me here at the studio, because nothing I read bothered to mention his motives. Why Holoniak's colleagues believe that he deserved a Nobel Prize for the invention? The inventor himself said, It's ridiculous to think that somebody owes you something. We're lucky to be alive when it comes down to it. If I asked one of my listeners overseas if I could borrow a biro, they'd know that I needed a ballpoint pen. This international genericization that never quite made it into the American vocabulary comes from Laszlo Biro, inventor of the ballpoint pen. When the ballpoint pen was first offered for sale in the U.S. in 1945, hundreds of people lined up to buy them, despite the fact that they cost more than $150 in today's money. $150 for something you've already lost three of this morning. So badly did people want to get rid of their fountain pens, which many of us have never seen and most of us will never use. 
which required constant refills and leaked like a pregnant woman sneezing. Within 15 years of their launch, the pens would cost a tenth of what they did initially, and in the years since, ballpoint pens have actually changed the way people write. Handwriting experts say that cursive writing doesn't flow as naturally with ballpoint pens, since they require more pressure. The invention of the ballpoint pen might even have saved the lives of Byro's family. He wasn't the first to come up with the idea of a ballpoint pen, but his was the first design to really catch on. An American lawyer, with the amazingly appropriate name John Loud, patented a version in 1888, but his pen could write on leather and cloth, but not paper, so I'd hazard he shouldn't even have bothered. When the Hungarian Biro invented his version of the ballpoint pen in 1938, he was working as a journalist and got the idea from newspaper printing presses, whose ink dried much more quickly than fountain pen ink, and used a rolling cylinder. Cylinders are bi-directional, they can go forward and back, but a pen tip would need to be omnidirectional to be truly useful. The inspiration to solve that part of it came actually from a game of marbles that a group of children were playing outside Byro's window. Byro patented the invention in Paris later that year. A few months after he signed a contract with a business partner to produce and market his ballpoint pens, Byro had to flee Hungary. Byro was Jewish, and Hungary, which was at the time allied with Nazi Germany, was becoming an increasingly hostile place for Jews. In the same year that Byro got his patent, Hungary passed laws limiting Jews' ability to work and banned the exportation of intellectual property. So Byro, who claimed to have converted to Christianity, left the country, sketches and notes in hand before the law went into effect. He and his brother made their way across Europe and the Atlantic, finally landing in Argentina, where Byro began manufacturing pens commercially. Sometimes it just takes one big order to launch a company, and Byro landed a peach of a client, the UK's Royal Air Force. Fountain pens leaked even worse at high altitudes, and they can't write on a surface that's not completely flat, such as a notepad being held against a wall. So they weren't ideal for keeping flight logs. Despite the initially high cost of ballpoint pens, the RAF ordered 30,000. The United States Air Force would order Byro's pens as well. Byro didn't profit as much as he could have from his invention. He ended up selling the last of his shares in his company to raise money to help get his family to Argentina. Though the patent of the ballpoint pen would probably be worth billions by now, Byro had no regrets about trading it to save his family. All else being equal, inventors refusing to claim exclusive rights to their creations are rare. An inventor having to testify in court that no one should be able to claim rights to it is even more rare. Such a man is Tim Berners-Lee. Wait a minute, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know that name. Yeah, he's the guy who created the World Wide Web. Berners-Lee learned about electronics as a child, tinkering with a model railroad and received a first-class Bachelor of Arts degree in Physics from Queen's College London in 1976. While at university, Berners-Lee made a computer out of an old television set that he bought from a repair shop. In the late 1980, bits of technology that would eventually grow into the internet that is today as ubiquitous as electricity did exist. While working at CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory, Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web an internet-based hypermedia initiative for global information sharing. To broad stroke that, combining existing technology to make it more than the sum of its parts. In 1989, CERN was the largest internet node in Europe, and Berners-Lee saw an opportunity to join hypertext with the internet. I just had to take the hypertext idea and connect it to the transmission control protocol and domain name system idea, and ta-da! World Wide Web. Creating the web was really an act of desperation, because the situation without it was very difficult when I was working at CERN. Most of the technology involved in the web, like the hypertext, like the internet, multi-font text objects, had all been designed already. I just had to put them together. 
In February 2012, Berners-Lee had to show up in court for the first time in his life. He was needed to testify in a patent trial in Texas. Berners-Lee was one of several web pioneers who appeared in court over the course of a four-day trial against a company called Olus, one of the most fearsome patent trolls of all time. For the benefit of those listeners who think trolls are just the things that live under bridges waiting for billy goats to come by, a patent troll is a person or company that uses patent infringement claims to win court judgments or stifle competition. Sometimes they legitimately hold the patent, but in the case of Olus, a company with no products on the market, started by a man named Michael Doyle, not so much. Olus's lawyers claimed that he invented interactivity on the web, based solely on a program he created in 1993 that allowed doctors to view embryos online. Under Doyle's conception of his own invention, any modern website owes him royalties. If you do something on a website or online game and something else happens, that infringes Doyle's patents. Unlike many patent trolls who will settle for settlements just under the cost of litigation, Doyle's company had the chops, the lawyers, and apparently the time, to extract tens of millions of dollars from major corporations. In 1999, they filed a lawsuit saying that Microsoft's Internet Explorer violated his patent on interactive features. It actually worked, and the jury awarded Olus $540 million. Appeals ensued, but they were inconclusive, and, presumably to stem the bleeding, the case was settled for more than $100 million, with just over $30 million going to Olus's co-plaintiff, the University of California, where he worked when he filed his patent. A patent that was denounced by the web's global standard-setting body in 2003. The U.S. Patent Office actually re-examined the patent, a rare occurrence indeed, that came at the behest of Berners-Lee and his contemporaries. But no action was taken afterwards, and Olus was right on to the next lawsuit. 20. Lawsuits. Against the likes of eBay, Adobe, Google, Yahoo, and Amazon. Court documents show the company was seeking more than $600 million, which had inflated to more than a billion dollars by the time of trial. Fortunately, the jury in East Texas found the patents invalid. Olus appealed, I'm shocked, and filed an infringement lawsuit against Facebook, Disney, and Walmart, still sarcastically shocked. Those lawsuits had asserted the two invalidated patents as well as two new ones, which incorporated the first patent. Olus mounted a lengthy appeal, but it was all for naught. A three-judge appeals panel affirmed the jury's verdict without further comment. Without the patent, all of Olus's active lawsuits were dead in the water. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. But to continue with Wilhelm Rontgen and the X-rays. A few months after his accidental discovery, Rontgen published a paper on a new kind of rays. He made a presentation before the Würzburg Medical Society and x-rayed the hand of a prominent anatomist who proposed naming the new ray after Rontgen. X-ray technology took off all over the world and Rontgen won the first ever Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Not a single penny of any profits generated by the sales or use of X-ray machines ever found its way to Rontgen's pocket. He wanted X-rays to be available for the benefit of mankind. That was his choice, as was leaving instructions for his lab notes to all be burned after his death. Go figure. Remember, you can always find the script for today's episode and the research sources at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me.